morning, church. Good morning. I'm Hez, one of the elders here, and I will be bringing the word this morning. Amen, church. Amen. Let us pray. Empty me now, Father, of anything that would stand in the way of your word going forth with clarity and truth. Even now, Lord, I, I feel the burden of such a weighty text, and so I pray that you give me strength and that you would give me the words to say even now. Pray these things in Jesus' name. In 1960, during an interview on Meet the Press, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made one of the most provocative and repeated statements of his ministry. It was during this interview, church, that he stated that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning was one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hours in Christian America. He went on to say that the thought of having an integrated church shouldn't be a thought at all, of not having an integrated church, but that the Christian church should definitely be integrated. In fact, he says, church, that any church that stands against integration and has a, in a segregated body is standing against the spirit and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And he says it fails to be a true witness. Though the most repeated part of this indictment on the church is at the beginning of the statement. For me, the spirit of this statement, church, finds its foundation towards the end. You see, Dr. King was pointing out the hypocrisy of the American church, who at the time, even the nation would have identified as a Christian nation, a Christian nation whose church stands at the foundation of its core. And he is saying, how is it that it can truly be a Christian nation or a Christian church when the essential core of the gospel is an integrated unity and yet you are fighting to keep a segregated disunity, church? The very thought of it is antithetical to the gospel and oxymoronic. And this is the very point of Dr. King's statement, church. And it also stands as the crux of Paul's ministry, including his letter to the Philippian church. In fact, Paul says that it's this truth that was the mystery of the gospel that has now been revealed to him. That is, church, that there is an inclusion or an integration of all people that they might come to God by faith in Christ. And y'all not shouting this morning, but y'all must not know who's preaching. Mm. Both Paul and Dr. King in the unraveling of this great mystery church are revealing to us that how we live in relationship to each other matters. Because how we relate to one another within our Christian community church serves as a witness to our gospel message that we preach which means that a church divided fails to be a true witness. And this is why Paul says in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 7, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
Because there is a manner or a way that the church is called to live that serves as a collective witness of gospel truth, church. There is a way of interacting with and treating each other that puts his gospel on display. A way that Paul says in verse 28 serves as a sign to the world. A sign of their destruction and of your salvation. Therefore, if the church is divided and does not live in this very manner, then that church is not a true witness. And as Dr. King said, it stands against the spirit and the teachings of Jesus Christ. This indictment was an indictment on the church in Paul's day. It was true in MLK's day, church, and it still stands as an indictment on the church that rings true in our day. An indictment that Paul is combating as he is encouraging the Philippian church, encouraging them to live in a way that puts gospel unity on display. That exemplifies the heart of Christ, the heart of our great king who came to us as our great servant church. The one that came that we might be his covenant people, a covenant people with a heart like his, a heart that shares in love and sympathy that he has for us, a love that is set on sharing in true kononia and fellowship church, a love displayed in a community of people who lives to place the needs of others above themselves. Paul is saying, church, Live in this way. Live in this manner so that you might resist the enemy who is looking to devour you, church. The enemy who the Bible says is looking to sift you like wheat and cause division among you. He is reminding us to flee from self-service and self-righteousness. To flee from self-exaltation that comes from the pursuit of the empty glory of this world. A glory, church, that Satan is constantly tempting us with, church, as he waves before us our greatest self-serving desires. Desires that Paul says brings about division, vain glory. That causes all kinds of division even in our church today. Tell me, church, how is it that in this day, in a day where we have so much theological insight, in a day where we have books on books on books, go to Cam's office. (laughs) They're there. How is it that in this day, church, the church seems to be even more divided than ever? Not only is there racial divide, church, but there is political divide. There is social justice divide. There is a divide about women and their roles in the church, economic divide, theological divide, to the point where we must ask, is there a place where we are truly, actually united? Where we must ask, what is it that truly unites us, church? Because if the answer is the gospel, then there should be nothing that can divide us. This is what Matthew 19 and 6 says. It says, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, no, that's about marriage. That's a principle applied to marriage. But you know what, church? That principle serves as a greater principle pointing to Christ and the church. Ah. A principle that points to the fellowship that we share in each other. The same fellowship church that is in the triune God as Father, Son, and Spirit lives in perfect harmony with one another. Therefore, if the gospel truly unites us, 
How is it that we can let anything divide us? How is it that we can speak as if life together is not possible? This is what they're saying. The multicultural church can't exist. We can't figure it out. They say when, when the minorities come, all the majority people leave. How? How? When this is the gospel that we share. Oh, I'm not even to the text yet. Help me, Jesus. Paul says, other than the fact that there are some who claim to follow Christ but are not truly following in his way. Those who Paul says are living for their own selfish ambition. And so if this is what we are facing this morning, church, this is what it is. This is the indictment that Paul is addressing with this text. As he reminds us that there is a way a perfect way that we are called to live as followers of Christ, a way where we are fleeing selfish ambition and running hard towards humility, a humility that calls for us to count others as more significant than ourselves as we look not to our own interests but also to the interests of others, a way that is counter to the world. And Paul lays out, the reason for that way for us this morning, church. And so let's jump into this text as I just really walked you from Philippians 1 all the way to 2, if you haven't noticed, to get to the greatest or one of the greatest texts in the New Testament. One that lays out for us the very life of Christ revealing to us the great humility of his dissension that is pregnant with doctrine that develops our gospel ethic, an ethic that should move us to model the very life of Christ to the world, this other-centered life that requires the essential of a new understanding, a new understanding that Paul is invoking us to have as he encourages us first in verse 5 to have the mind of Christ. He begins in verse 5, church, by telling us, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul says, before you begin to try to live out this new way, first begin by developing a new mind. He says, have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus as the mind is what shapes our way. Paul realizes that before this life truly takes shape in action, it must first take shape in understanding. An understanding that he says is already yours. Meaning this understanding, church, has been granted to us much in the same way that Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that all things pertaining to life and godliness have been granted to us. Church, this is a granting that does not always immediately manifest itself, but a granting that requires taking hold of, church, And I'm going to fire hydrant you a little bit this morning, so just roll with me, okay, note takers? (laughs) A taking hold of that requires a deep abiding and searching out. A searching out that begins to shape and change the deeper inner workings of our mind as the word of God begins to take hold in our heart. A heart that leads our mind as it directs us to develop new desires. Desires, church, for God and his word that stand as the foundation for a new posture or a new way. And so Paul says, have this mind. Many would call this new way a worldview a way that sees and gives value to the things around us, 
Paul is saying that there must be a new way of understanding and seeing the world, a way that will drive for you to count the value of others as more significant than yourself. A drive, church, that forms in you a Christian ethic that leads you to live in the same way of Christ, a way that puts his servant heart on display, a heart that is guided by the word that permeates from deep inside of it, his word that becomes of greatest importance to us as it stands as the foundation for what conforms us into Christ, conforms us, church, into his likeness. A conforming that he promises he will give. A conforming that comes as those who have received his heart and his spirit begin to walk in his way. Is that not what he promised church to us? In Ezekiel 11 verses 19 through 20 where he says, And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put in them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues and keep my rules and obey them. You see, church, Ezekiel begins knitting for us this gospel thread that Paul carries through his letter as he foretells of the heart, the very heart and spirit of Christ that we as believers have received. He says, I will give them what? One heart. And I will put what in them? A spirit. Notice that he does not say, I will give them new hearts and new spirits, church. But Ezekiel is pointing us to the fact that this new people will share in a oneness and unity of heart and spirit that will cause them to walk in the same way and manner of the very one who gives it to them, church. Y'all not happy yet. (sighs) You getting there, though. A manner worthy of the gospel as they walk in the statues of God and obey his ways. Paul says, let the heart and spirit of Christ lead you with a new thinking and a new mind so that this new mind and this new way would be a manner of Christ that would lead you to walk in his ways. A way of thinking and living that put the ways and statues of the Lord God on display. This is what Paul also says to us in Ephesians 4, verse 17, when he says, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Why, Paul? Because he says they are darkened in their understanding, church, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their what? Hardness of heart. In other words, he says, don't walk in that way because they walk in a way with people who minds cannot understand and their minds cannot comprehend because they don't have a heart and a spirit like Christ. In fact, Paul says they have a heart of stone. Therefore, they still practice all the things that serves themselves But he says in verse 20, church, but this is not your way. He says, that's not the way that you have learned. That's not the way where you learn to put off your old self, meaning to put off your old self-serving ways and let the spirit and heart of Christ renew your mind that you might think in a new way and put on the likeness of Christ. 
a likeness that reflects the true righteousness and holiness of God, church. Righteousness and holiness that gives allegiance to obedience of the mission of God. A mission that requires the humility of God, a humility that the world does not know of as they have not received Christ. I hope this is making sense, church. I hope it's clear to you because it is so clear to me in my heart for all the world knows is the ways of Satan. The same Satan who Isaiah speaks of in chapter 14 and 13 when he says, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Satan says, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud and I will make myself like the most high. Is this not what we see today, church? Is this not what drives the actions of this world Isn't this the pursuits that we see that causes people to fight for positions at their job, to lord over and abuse women, to sell poison and dope to their brothers and sisters, to steal and kill from each other? Isn't this the posture that we see, church, as those who are seeking Twitter glory, leading others to sin? Paul says, you must no longer, church, Walk in this way because that way is the way of the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. It's the way, church, of the one who wants to divide and conquer us. The divide that comes as he tempts our minds to chase after the vain glories of this world. Therefore, We must have a mind that understands, church, the brokenness of this world so that our ways might point them to our great restorer. A restorer who calls for us not to be divided, but to be a community of people who are willing to strive side by side, seeking the good of each other, striving for humility as we take on the posture of our great suffering Savior. A Savior who who John says is love in its purest form. Love that was manifested in the greatest act of sympathy and affection as our great God came to us. This is what Paul shows us as he begins in verse 6 by saying that this great God is the one who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This great love and humility that permeated from Christ showed itself through the compassion that led him to come to us, church. A compassion that Dane Ortland says in his book, Gentle and Lonely, is the dominant note ring, left ringing in the ears after reading the Gospels. He says the most vivid and arresting element of this portrait painted for us is the way the Holy Son of God moves towards, touches, heals, embraces, and forgive those who least deserve it, yet truly desire it. Paul also, like Ortland or Ortland, like Paul, paints for us this great portrait of Christ as he is encouraging us to have that great element of compassion dwelling inside of us as well. To have hearts, church, and minds that pour out of a great humility as he has had for us. Hearts that moves towards the broken. Hearts that heals, embrace, and forgives 
those who hurt you the most, the ones that least deserve it, yet truly desire it. We are called to have a mind that is gripped with compassion and a reverence that will cause us to live out a holy and righteous life that we would be a community of people, much like the community in Acts 2, where it says in verses 44 through 47, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is what the witness of the true church looks like as it displays a humility church that leads to repentance and gospel fruit, a way of thinking that leads to a way of living as we become a community who don't just have the mind of Christ, but those who actually will take that mind and live out the life of Christ. Paul continues to paint this great, picture for us by reminding us of what this way of Christ led Christ to do as he carried out the most exemplary act of humility known to man, one that I have a hard time even finding the words to explain church. I try to think of comparisons but quickly realize that Christ stands as incomparable. I tried to think of some simile or hyperbole or some poetic just gesture, but nothing felt good enough to express the glory of what Paul explains to us here, of what he is reminding us of. Even the fact that he has to remind us of something so glorious makes me wonder if we even understand it at all. But Paul, amen. (laughs) But Paul, in the best way that he could, under the inspiration of the Spirit, helps us to understand the great humility of Christ by giving us a contrast of forms. In order to shed light on the humility of Christ coming to us, he first reminds us of the form of the one who we are talking about, the same one that he wrote about in Colossians 1. The one who he says was in the form of God, or as he says in Colossians 1 and 15, is the very image of the invisible God. He reminds us that this is the one of whom he is speaking of, the one who all things, church, were created by. That is, all things, as he says, in heaven and on earth. Paul says, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all all things were created by this one. That is, church, he who is before all things and in him holds all things together. Paul says, this is the one, church, the one who John tells us was in the beginning, the one who was and is God, creator of you and I, who holds all power in his hand, who Isaiah tells us has a train that will fill the temple who rules over all things with majesty and splendor. It's this Christ who Paul Paul says was willing, church, to disrobe himself of all glory and majesty and splendor, willing to give up all his status and privilege and power, counting it as nothing. Nothing! Ha! Ha! 
to come to a broken people like you and me and wrap himself in our flesh, not fighting one bit to hold on to any power or status. But Paul says he emptied himself, not one drop, to come to us, taking the form of a servant because of his great love for us. That was far greater than his comfort and glory. Jesus, the great God and creator of this universe, church, emptied himself of all of that for you. The one who in his whole existence have only existed to be served, descended and lowered himself to the form of a servant coming to us through the very womb of a woman that he knitted and put together. God, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and is in all places at all times, subjected himself to growing in the womb of a woman that he might be born dependent on others for food, And sustenance. Do you understand the great humility of your God, church? Having to learn to walk and read and write. Paul says he left his throne where he was served by all. And he now comes as servant to all things and all people. In a service of humility. As he is being prepared to face his greatest suffering. Jesus exemplifies to us, church, one who didn't have a drop of selfish ambition. He did not fight to stay sitting on the throne of the glory of God. And yet Satan is fighting and trying to convince you to do everything to try to ascend to that great glory. As he tempts us, church, to indulge in the same posture that he has, pursuing ascension with everything that he has, with everything that is in him. And this is the very posture that he tempts Christ with in the wilderness. How foolish, church. How foolish was it to tempt the very one who has just left that position, giving it all up to try to go back and grab to hold it. How can you tempt him with something that he didn't fight to hold on to? I almost want to believe that Satan can't believe that this is the Christ. I mean, this is Satan, church, who was with him in glory. He was with him in heaven. He must be saying to himself, no way this is the son of God. He was there, church leading the great orchestra of angels to sing to his praises. And now the very one who he was serving in glory is here in the form of the created things of this world. I can't imagine what he was thinking. And he has been working day in and day out, never resting, trying to ascend that throne of God. And now here is the very son of God whom he was singing praises to, giving up his place on the throne. Ah, To come to the people as a servant. How foolish was it for him to try to offer Jesus anything? When he has given up everything. 
And it's with this same foolishness and blindness, church, that he is working so hard to convince you that you need those same things. But how foolish is it, church, for him to offer the church anything when Christ has already given us everything? What can he offer you? What vain glory can he tempt you with that would cause you to drop everything that Christ has given you, everything that he has done for you, to take on the posture of one working to ascend to get it? Pressing towards the vain desires of this world. How foolish does that sound to us, church? When you have been given a seat in the kingdom of heaven. Christ says, I have written your name in the Lamb's book of life, never to be blotted out. How long will we fall into the trap of Satan believing that he can offer us something greater than that? Paul says, Christ came and tasted death on our behalf so that we might no longer live for ourselves, chasing after our own glory, but so that we might live for him who for our sake died and was raised. This is what he tells us, church, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, for if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised uh, and was raised. He says, from now on, therefore, regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, church. That is, I'm not done yet. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This church is the message that Paul gives in every epistle. The same word that he writes to every church so that we might think in the way that Christ thinks, so that we might live the way that Christ lived. Paul says, so that we might live as ambassadors for Christ, as he is making his appeal through us to the world. That is through the testimony of our mouths and our lives, that we might be a true witness of his gospel truth, controlled, as Paul said, by his love, as his great love reconciles the world. This church is why your life matters. Because he wants to dress you in his ways and likeness, no longer living for yourself, but for him who not only descended to come to us, but took on the greatest act and form of humility and obedience in that he died for us. Facing the shame, the most shameful death as he hung on the cross for our sins. This is why Paul says at the beginning of chapter two in Philippians, if there is any encouragement in what Christ has done for you, 
any comfort from his great love for us, any participation in the spirit that he has provided for us, then complete my joy by being of the same what? Mind. By being of the same way. By thinking on one accord that comes from a heart of gratitude, gratitude that leads us to continue the very mission of Christ. A mission that requires unity of mind and humility of heart, church. As we face the suffering that comes with living out this great life, Paul said earlier, be willing to face persecution and suffer for the glory of Christ. Become obedient to this way that he is calling us to unto death. The church today as a whole seems to have lost that way. We have lost this type of thinking and and I feel like we have maybe folded some into the ways of this world. In the face of suffering, we have become those who are fighting for privilege and platform that has caused the church as a whole to bear false witness. The world says, why would I follow you when you are a bunch of hypocritical people? Living in the ways of the prince of the power of air as he fights to keep us divided. I pray, church, and I pray that you would pray with me that the church can find its way back. Back to a way of thinking that unites us in living out this great gospel message. In the face of a broken world, in the midst of a world divided, a world plagued by hopelessness, church, and violence, inflamed with the fire of brokenness and sin. A world that needs to know of a God who came down from heaven to serve us as our great Savior. A great Savior who Paul tells us is now sitting on the throne of God. As he says in verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul now brings this great gospel story to a close as he points us to the very plot twist of Christ's great story of redemption. As the great suffering savior who was willing to empty himself and gives up everything receives his great reward and great exaltation. Some theologians say this, that he was super exalted. <laughs> That means many exaltations and the highest exaltation that you can receive. He says, they say this is what it means when it says that he received the highest place as the father exalts him and places on him a name that is above every name. The one who descended to the lowest place has now uh, ascended. The one who descended to the lowest place has now ascended back to his highest place. A reward, church, for his great obedience and humility. A reward for a willingness to come to us and die on our behalf. Paul says, follow in this way, church. Follow in the way of our suffering Savior so that you too can have a great reward so that you might share in the glory of Christ. Paul lays out another great contrast, and I'm closing slowly. As the one who is willing, as the one who was willing to take on the lowest position and face the most shameful death, now receives the highest position and is given the most glorious name. Jesus receives the greatest honor. For great humility, the one who counted, uh, the one who counted us, 
uh, as more significant than himself now has been restored to the most significant position as Lord of all. And he died that we might share in that great glory, that we might have a place with him in his great eternal kingdom of power. Church, this is the very thing that Satan has been trying to do, working hard day in and day out to try to gain. And Christ comes down in the form of a servant and says, I'm taking you with me. Taking you with him to have a seat at his table. A great reward for all who are willing to lay down their lives for their brothers and sisters to be a great witness to this world, even in the face of death. Death, that Paul says, is a small price to pay for such a great reward. He says, a light momentary affliction in the face of everlasting glory, church. This is why he says that death will be better by far. Why he was willing to take on the form of a servant, willing to walk in the ways of the Lord unto death. Because he knows that he will receive a crown of unfading glory and eternal bliss with the Lord. This is what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 18 and 4. He says, whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why, he says in Matthew 23 and 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Why, James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. Why, Revelation 3 and 21 says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Why, Isaiah 57 says, for thus the one who is high and lifted up who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, says, I will dwell in the high place and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit. To do what? To revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Ah, church, this is good news. And it has always been part of God's plan that the one who was high and lifted up will come down to dwell with us, to revive us in spirit and heart so that we might have his mind, so that we might live in his ways, and so that we might receive the greatest glory. Therefore, place your trust in this today. Place your trust in his great and precious promises and flee any empty pursuit. Taking up your cross, living in his way, imitating him so that there will be no division amongst us. So that his church in all humility and obedience might stand as a true witness. So that one day we might stand with him in glory. Amen, Amen, church. Let us pray.